<clears throat> well, every other year there is someone coming in front of an audience and telling the people, I want to save the world. So I guess I may have a shot of it because I tell you I want to save the world. But save from which threat? If I want to save the world, I have to convince you that the end is near. So if you look at that, we have a lot of problems with germs. Since a few years now, we know that the microbes evolve faster than the chemist can generate new antibiotics. And because their Darwinian selected to develop resistance, at some point, people cannot no longer be treated. And we, we know the concept of multi-resistant drugs, superbugs, like the press calls them. And I could compile a bunch of those uh, press extracts. And if I tell you that now, since a few years, we have in bacteriology the concept of toto resistant. Toto. For the one who knows Latin, means toto. Okay? You, you, uh, you follow me? So toto resistant means you have not a single molecule that can wipe the damn bug. That happens. We had last year the first death at the NIH in Bethesda, Washington, of, a bacteria, of seven people with a bacteria that cannot be tamed. It's not a big deal now, but give it 20, 30 more years. Well, we go back to the 20s of the 20th century, where when you get a, a lung infection, it was one chance out of three to die. So the end of the world is not now, but if we don't wake up, we might uh, not like what we have 50 years from now. Essentially, we have a solution, because I'm not interested in the problem. The solution is that the bacteria have bacteriophage, bacterial killer. And here, this is the solution. You have two vials. One is more milky, the other is bluish. The bluish are the bacteria are dead. The milkish, you don't see the same light through it. The bacteria are still alive. The difference between the two vials is that in one, you have a few microliters of phage solution, phage, bacteriophage. What are bacteriophage? Well, essentially, they're viruses. Viruses for bacteria. This is uh, an example of them. Uh, the length of this bug uh, is like 300 to 400 water molecule in lung. You have a head, you have a tail, you have some fibers there. It looks like the lunar, lunar landing module from the NASA Apollo mission. And essentially, it kills bacteria. How does it do it? Very simply, it injects its DNA via the tail. It lands like the, the moon lander on the bacteria, inject the DNA. Once the DNA goes in the bacteria, it replicates. The bacteria then, if you look at the right side, explodes and it's dead. It's fail-proof. It works in two minutes. It works. Now, uh, there's the idea. We can use the bacterial killer as a way to substitute for failing antibiotics. And Phage have two advantages on bacterial molecule or antibacterial molecule. First, they've been around for billions of years, fighting the bacteria all around, and they can control the bacteria. In two billion years, they have never found a way inside our cells, the cell of plant or the cell of animals, because we hire cell. The DNA language is not the same, so they're safe. They will never enter one of our cells. Billion years of practice, quite safe. Then they co-evolve. That means that because they fight a germ warfare with their host bacteria, if the bacteria try to escape them, they catch them back. These two qualities make them ideal products to develop against bacteria. This is an illustration. You have two sine waves. You know, scientists like to make it complex, but it's very simple. In black, you have the bacteria. Bacteria population rise. Then you have the phage. In red, they rise again. As soon as the phage population for this bacteria increases and reaches apex, essentially the bacterial population collapses, and so on. This has been happening in nature for billions of years. Phage are controlling the bacteria as we're speaking. As I'm speaking here in this audience hall, per cubic meter of air, we have one billion of phage particles. You're breathing in out phage as I'm talking. Now, this is the only scientific slide I want to show you, then I will go to the core of our problem. I told you it was an evolving problem. The bacteria and the phage could escape each other or catch each other. This is a proof of Darwinian in test tube. So, for those of you who don't believe in evolution, I'm sorry, this is a bad message. This is evolution. If you look at the, uh, the array, you have gray. Gray is resistant, white is sensitive. 
uh, the B uh, value there are per, per square you have 20 different bacterial strain. So you have from B2 to B12 every time 20, 20, 20. So it's like 240 there. On the P scale, you have per square 20 different phages. So you have a matrix of 20 times 20, and we follow with time from P2, P4 to P12. This is evolution. You see that with time, time goes down. You have more and more white square. White square means those bacteria are killed by this phage. Although in the first line, you know, the, the top of this uh, graphic, all the bacteria were resistant. So they co-evolve in the lab, they co-evolve in nature. And when I tell you that this takes six to 10 hours, this is awfully fast, better than any chemist can do. Now we have a problem. Why, if this is solution, why, if this is so evident, only Martin Zizi talks about it and the rest of the planet couldn't care less? Why? Well, there are reasons, of course. It's our business model, the, the model of healthcare that prevents it to change. Think about it. We all hear in the press that it's because the doctor overprescribe. We're all bad guys. We, we do too much prescription. So, as a consequence, we receive bacterial resistance. Well, it's the other way around. A molecule comes on the market, it, is, it has no resistance. After two years, we have a few percent. After five years, we have 30% resistance. As soon as you have resistance, doctors who are not all stupid. They stop prescribing. But then the industry say, well, we lose money. It costs a billion to make. So we have to enlarge the basin. We have to overprescribe to recoup the money. So essentially, and hear me well, overprescription follows resistance not the other way around, like every journalist says. This is important. Then if you think about the patent law, you know, IP is intellectual property. We're protecting our molecule, and it's normal, because bringing a new molecule in the domain of therapeutics, so to cure people, costs between half a billion euro or a billion euro. So it, it takes investment. You want to be protected as to recoup your cost and make a business out of it. No problem with that. But think about we're protecting a molecule like penicillin for 20 years. After three years, the germ couldn't care less. So there is a mismatch. So that's why we want overprescription, because we have three to five years' time to recoup a billion euro instead of 20 years. This is quite powerful an idea. Then, the clinical trial, when you want to come up on the market, you need to ensure safety efficacy. But this costs a lot. That's why. Uh, a new drug costs like a billion to make. So essentially, and I'm reiterating this, this is our model. Our model is essentially incompatible with antibiotherapy. Then you have other problems that are benign because a phage doesn't exist. You know, it's not a biological, it's not a molecule. It's a virus, but it's not a life. If something doesn't exist, you cannot use it. How do you make a test? If I want to test it and prove that it functions, I need to prove that it's effective and safe. We know it's safe for ages because the Russian, the Georgian, in the East, they had no antibiotics from the war on. And they tried phage therapy, and it works, and it was nearly without side effect. But we cannot use their data because they're not made according to Western standards. They're not GMP, good, manage, uh, good, good practice, good manufacturing practice, actually. So essentially, we have to redo the whole experiment, which is costly. Billions again. The, type, the time needed to certify a phage preparation against bacteria will be like five or ten years. By the time the medication is not market, the bacteria have forgotten and couldn't care less anymore. So essentially, once again, we have this circular argument. To prove that something is safe and effective, uh, when, I, when I tried to make a clinical trial at Brussels University, they asked me at the biotechnical committee, yeah, but Martin, is this safe? Yes, two billion years of safety. Yeah, yeah, okay, but is it safe? Yes. Is it effective? Well, in animal, in the East, I want to show that in, in patient in Brussels. Yeah, but you have to tell us that it's safe and effective, and then you may do the experiment to prove it's safe and effective. And then I went, well, I don't get this. It took us a year, but we made it. We proposed, we, we manufacture, we produce a batch according to the best standard, and we tried it on patients at the burn unit in Brussels. And I was very eager, that was three years ago, because it was a first ever clinical study with phage therapy in the Western Hemisphere, perfectly legal and kosher. The problem, I could prove it was safe because there had no side effect. 
I could not prove it effective because they forbade me to retrieve the antibiotics. So I had to give the phage while the patient received the antibiotic at the same time. How do I prove it works? So, again, the circular argument. So how to, how to cut that circle? How to go uh, another future to? Well, I have a few good or bad ideas, depending on where you are in the debate. I think if we want ever to solve the problem of our relationship with germs, which is important, and believe me, in 50 years it will be more acute than now, we have no choice but we have to kill this 20-year protection for antibiotics. I'm not saying get rid of the patent law. I would be uh, killed on the spot at the end of this meeting. I say, for the sake of humanity, given that the model is counterproductive for our own good, well-being of society as a whole, we cannot afford to protect antibiotic for 20 years. So it should be open source. Well, I, I, they might... They might uh, scratch my car at the end of this talk if I say that, but I dare to say it. We have to open source the intellectual protection for uh, antibiotherapy because it's a common good of, you, of all humankind, actually. Then the regulators have to be educated. Educated is a bad word, informed, because they're not idiots. I remember two years ago, I went twice at the EMA in London. EMA is like the FDA, but for Europe. And, uh, you know, you have to take an appointment, they receive you, they listen to it, it's formatted, and then they say, what's your problem? You can go to the market, just prove it, it's safe and effective. And I say, well, change the law. I cannot, make, I cannot be allowed to make the test because to prove it's safe and effective, I have to tell you that it's safe and effective in the first place. And they say, we don't see your problem. It took us two meetings, and then at the end of the second meeting, they say, okay, I think you got a point. So now they, they, they got educated, but it took, took us two years to get a single stupid message across because they think formatted. Then we have to convince all stakeholders, because to change the world, I cannot go to the EMA, I cannot talk here. It's, it's, it helps, but it's not the way to do it. The whole of society has to be convinced that something has to be done. And the health economy has to be studied. Swapping the antibiotic molecule with phage therapy, which costs nearly nothing, and that might be another problem, because on a yearly basis, antibiotherapy brings 3.7 billion euro a year in Europe alone. So if I propose to change a 3.7 billion market into a few tens of million a year market, well, I have a few friends also that will watch me at the end of this meeting. Essentially, we have to convince society that money is good. I have no problem with it. But for some spot, for some activities belonging to human, we might trade off safety instead of uh, greed, I think. And then we have to spread the word, uh, because essentially phage are quite safe. We're breathing in and out all those viruses as we're speaking. Uh, in the yogurt, you have zillions of them. I, don't, I, I won't tell any brand, but we know them. They're even good for our health. And uh, this is what I really do believe this will work. But alone, I cannot do it. So please help. I thank you for your patience.